And so the gospel lesson for, from the book of John. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say to us, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own account, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works of themselves. Truly, truly, I tell you, if the, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my Father's name, so that my Father may be glorified, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor does it know him. You know him because he abides in you, and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of Lord. Let us pray. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, God, for the blessings of this Holy Word. Thank you for your blessings of this day. Thank you for the blessing of the gift of the Holy Spirit that rained down upon your people in Pentecost. We pray that you would again come upon us today in a powerful way that your word and your work might be known. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our lesson for today from the Gospel of John is actually, again, prior to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but is a reminder again of the blessing that Jesus Christ wants to give his disciples and to <coughs> us, all those who would follow Jesus Christ and give the Holy Spirit. But it really starts with a very curious question by Philip, and so I've tried to communicate this to you in a way that might more accurately reflect what was being said and how it was understood. And so Philip, when he looks at Jesus, says to him, Hey, Jesus, I just need you to prove to me that you are in some way related to the Heavenly Father so that I might be assured all those years wandering in the desert with you, wandering place to place, living without enough food to eat, our bellies rumbling and, tum uh, and our, our tummies rumbling and just not having enough food in our bellies, with us going without being cold at night in the middle of the desert, going place to place, being threatened with death and, and harm because of our belief in you. I want to know if all these sacrifices that we made for you over these last three years have been worth our while. After all, Philip had spent three years following Jesus, as I mentioned to you, through many difficult things and through many good days as well. But there had to have been a feeling amongst many of the disciples of Jesus Christ of great disappointment that Jesus was not delivering on the type of results that they had hoped that he would deliver to them. Now when I say that, you have to understand the 12 disciples thought that Jesus was the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was going to come and lead a huge revolution and bring peace to the world. And that did not seem to be what was going on. Jesus certainly brought in large crowds. There's no doubt about it. But the large crowds that Jesus was bringing in were basically made up of a bunch of riffraff and also a lot of the dregs of society. Not the respectable people. All the people with money, all the people who could actually help with the revolution. Oh, Jesus kept pushing them and pushing them away and offending them every way he could. And so the disciples were sitting there saying, is he ever going to get with the program is he really who he claims to be? Now, if you're Jesus, on the other hand, look at what Jesus says in verse 9 and 10. He says basically to Philip, what do you think I've been doing these last three years with you? Huh? What have I been doing with you guys? Hasn't my presence with you been enough? Hasn't it been enough to demonstrate to you the relationship that I have with the Father? Have you ever loved somebody so deeply, so passionately, you care for them, you're there all the time for them, and then no matter what you do, they still doubt your love for them? This is how Jesus must have felt. So Philip was really concerned about whether or not his sacrifice of the last three years had been worthwhile. Jesus 
is really hurt to the bone. Because he had given and given and given and poured himself out for his disciples. And they still didn't think it was sufficient or enough. And so Jesus says, well, if you don't believe me because I've been so vulnerable to you, I've poured myself out to you, at least believe me because of the miracles that I've done. Who else has done the types of works that I've done? Disciples had access to the heart of Jesus Christ. God was revealed and became vulnerable in Jesus Christ. So Philip's question of Jesus had to have really hurt. After all these years, after everything I've done, you still do not believe. You're welcome to go to the back next page. As much as Jesus had given to his disciples, he still wasn't done giving, by the way. <clears throat> in fact, Jesus, we are told, goes on and does two things for us. The one he promises here in the scripture, but these things were both to come in the life of the disciples. They were about to see these things revealed to them. The first thing that Jesus gave was his life. The second thing he gave to them was the gift of the Spirit. And this is unprecedented in the history of the world. This is something nobody else has done or ever will do for you. Let's take a look at the first one. First thing he gives to them is the gift of his life. Now, I have said many times over the last several weeks that it is foolish for you to think that your giving your life up for anybody will amount to anything or transform or change anybody's life. Because giving your life is not what God calls you to do, and it's a worthless act of sacrifice. God doesn't want you to give your life for anybody. What God wants you to do is live your life for other people. You can't live your life for other people if you're dead. You are called to be here. You have a purpose here. You have a reason for being here. God has placed you here for a reason, and it's not to die, it's to live. Jesus, on the other hand, his death was the only death that meant anything for humanity. Why? Because Jesus is the love of God. We humans are threatened by that love, by the way, and I'm going to tell you, we are threatened because it threatens our power structures on the planet. Our power structures are ruled by law and the gun. I mean, I hate to say we talk about the United States being a free country, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to be an American citizen. I think it's a fantastic thing. But make no mistake, every law on the book in the United States of America is enforced by a gun. The gun a police officer holds or the gun that our military holds. You don't obey by force and by threat. We will make you obey. The laws of our countries are threatened by love because love says we don't need any sticking laws. We live in love and therefore love basically makes law and countries and power extinct. And you can see why people in power don't like this idea of love. And it's for that reason that Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, we like to think that we'd be different today. Oh, we wouldn't crucify Jesus. Really? We wouldn't? Honestly. How many messengers of love have we killed? I don't know. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi? Mm -hmm. Okay. I could go on. There. Uh, yeah, he became a loving person. And he certainly had his struggles there at the beginning. But by the end of his life, he's really becoming a very goodly, kindly, loving person. That's correct. And there are many, many other. Bishop Oscar Romero, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, these messengers of love, we kill them. But Jesus isn't just a messenger of love. Jesus is the love of God. You can see why Jesus would be such a threat to those in power. But here's the amazing thing. We might kill the love of God because we don't want to fall under the indictment of God's love. But we can kill the love of God, Jesus Christ, but the love of God is relentless and unstoppable. It just keeps coming, no matter what you do. Oh, I got something for this. We just we had somebody here amongst us who just got a driver's license. Woo! -hoo. But I'll tell you, if you've ever had the opportunity to drive where it's really icy and you get the sheet of ice, you're going like two or three miles per hour, and you just tap your brakes, and all of a sudden your car just starts sliding and spinning around and it just doesn't say it's like no matter what you do you're out of control and you're just going along for the ride well that's kind of like the love of god it's kind of out of control it's unstoppable you can put your foot on foot on the brake pedal and try to stop it 
but it is relentless and it's just going to come. Yes, I just compared God's love to spinning out on ice. Don't know how effective it was, but I think you get the idea. It is relentless and unstoppable. There's nothing you can do to keep the love of God from coming into your life. And then, why did Jesus give his life? Because the death of Je and resurrection of Jesus Christ is ultimately the announcement of God's great love for us. Do you remember how often times, in fact, I do this every time I talk <clears throat> to people about baptism I and, and in marriage. So, uh, again, once again, you're, you might remember this when I talk to you in your uh, wedding classes and so forth. We talked about when God created the world, God spoke a word, let there be light, and there was light. Well, God went and tell the world, I love you, I forgive you. So what did God do? God spoke a word, and Jesus was born. That's who Jesus is. God's announcement of love and forgiveness to this world. And that shows you your great value that God places on your life. You are loved so much that God would rather die for you than live without you. So I'm going to tell you a story. 20 years ago, there's a woman in our church who was struggling fiercely with her value. She thought she was worthless and no good. She thought that nobody could love her. She thought that she was just the worst person on the face of the planet. She felt guilty about everything. And so what did she do? I'll tell you what she did. She threw herself into drinking alcohol because the one thing, at least for a short time, it would cover some of her pain. She started taking drugs. And then she still was unsatisfied. So she started throwing herself at every single man she could possibly meet. Because, hey, at least for a couple hours, you know that somebody loves you, as sick as that may be. And so this was a vicious cycle. She would throw herself at a man because at least for then he wanted her and desired her. And so once he got what he wanted, he went home. She felt dirty, awful, filthy. And then she'd go back to drinking and taking drugs until another guy would come along. And then she'd throw herself at that guy. You see how this vicious cycle kept going over and over and over again. She thought her biggest problem was she had to find a way to overcome the sin of... of uh, of having sex with all these guys. And I said, that's not your problem. I told her, that's not your problem. I said, you keep feeling guilty about this, and so you keep throwing yourself back into the same cycle over and over and over <clears throat> again. You're never going to break the cycle as long as you keep coming back to guilt. I feel awful. I feel filthy. I feel disgusting. That will never break until you realize that you look at yourself in the eye and mirror and see yourself the way God sees you. That's what's going to break the cycle for you. So why well, don't I understand? I said, here's how God sees you. God sees you as a person of value. God would never take advantage of you. You don't have to throw yourself at anybody. You don't have to take any drugs to carry it over, uh, cover all, over all the pain. God just loves you just as you are. How could God? After all, who cares? Stop dwelling on all the sin, all the dirt, all the filth, the sin, the dirt, the filth, the, the crap that you feel. Those are basically a bunch of rocks that you're carrying. Self-made bag behind your back. You're holding on to this because you somehow think you're not worthy. But God does, and that's the only important opinion, the only one that matters. Drop this rock. Drop this bag of rocks. Let go. It took her years. In fact, I'll tell you, there's one more story with us. Um, I'll tell you where the break point was. She came to me one day claiming that she was free of her drugs. And I go, oh, I'm free, I'm this, I'm that, I'm whatever. And I'm like, great. Oh, can you help me out? I need some help because I'm just kind of going through a tough time. She wanted me to take her to the store, took her to the store. And she went and bought a few groceries. And he said, oh, wait a minute, I forgot one thing. She ran back into the store. She came back out with a 24-pack of beer. <laughs> <laughs> I locked my door, by the way. And I said, see ya. Drove away. She threw down her 24-pack of beer, and she started cursing and swearing me. I didn't talk to her for probably three years. She wouldn't call me. She was so mad at me. <clears throat> but finally, two or three years later, she called me up, and she said, I realize you did the best thing in the world for me. I had to walk miles with a 24-pack of beer 
with beer spread all, you know, with, with, she said, I, I realized how pitiful it was. I broke open the box and I tried to cram over the beers that, that hadn't been broken in there. And I'm trying to sip all the beer that had broken over and spraying everywhere. And I realized, boy, my, I really need something better for my life. And her life was transformed, touched by God's love. Because all of a sudden she didn't see herself as that filthy person. She saw herself as a person who God loved. Even while she was drinking the beer, even when she was throwing herself at all those guys, God saw her differently than she saw herself as something precious and something valuable that he would rather die for than live without. Make no mistake. Don't ever doubt the value that you have in your life. Don't ever doubt your value ever again. So Jesus gifts us with life because of his great love for us. But then he gives us one more gift. You think I'm done? I've got one more gift that God wants to give to you today. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? That Spirit is the advocate who on our behalf advocates for us when we don't have the energy to do so and when life leaves us speechless and paralyzed. You've had those moments in your life where you're just at the end of your rope and you don't think you can take one more thing, but one more thing is always added to it, isn't it? It's a spirit in those times where you are just gasping for breath that comes and intervenes and advocates for you. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches you how to love, how to throw off the old power structures that oppress you. It is the Spirit of God that guarantees you no matter where you go in life, you will never be alone. And this I can tell you, there may come a day where everybody abandons you. Your family abandons you. Your friends abandon you. You feel like you don't have a friend in the world, and maybe you don't. I'm not here to promise you that. You might be completely and utterly friendless and alone at some point in your life, except for God. And that's where the Spirit comes to play, because the Spirit is the one who ministers to you and says, you are not abandoned. Everybody else might have left but God loves you. It's kind of like Moses. If you remember Moses in the Old Testament, when he was sitting there leading this rabble of Jews, that's what the Bible calls him, the rabble. Uh, it calls him a rabble of Jews. And, and he was so, so tired of their constant whining and complaining. Oh, Moses, we're so tired of the man, of the miraculous man that God has given us to keep us alive. If God really loved us, he would give us meat to eat, and so God provided quail. Oh, God, you know what, Moses? We're so sick and tired of this quail. It's the same thing every day. Manna and quail. Manna and quail. We're just so sick and tired of this. Wine, wine, wine. So you know what Moses does? Moses goes up to God and says, God, if you really love me, just kill me now. That's, that's almost a direct quote. He says, kill me. I'm done with these people. He felt like there was not a friend in the world, but there was a friend that he had in the world, and that was God. God said, well, sorry, you're going to live for these people, but I'm going to walk with you. Even in those times of great despair, God promises to walk with us. The Spirit brings us peace, even amidst the chaotic world, and inspires us to do spectacular works of kindness and love, some common and some miraculous. Take a look at the box at the bottom of the page. So who are you today? I'm going to tell you who you are. You are a spirit-filled and inspired masterpiece. Okay? You are a spirit-filled and inspired masterpiece of God. A walking billboard, an ambassador of the love of God to this world. And I'm asking you to never, ever, ever forget it. Let us pray. God, as I look around at those gathered here today, and maybe those who are watching live today, or will be watching the sermon later, every single one of them is a masterpiece of God, a brilliant work of art. So often we doubt it, and so often we throw ourselves away cheaply. Well, we do so because we haven't seen the value that placed upon us. So help us to look into the mirror and see ourselves the way you see us, as your masterpiece, as your beautiful piece of art, as the one for whom God would be willing to die rather than live without. 
And we are just so grateful and give thanks. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.